kind of pattern we followed in Physics 1. In fact, if you remember, I even said this is sort of advanced Physics 1. What we've just done is particle kinematics. Remember, that's the just the business of you know, the details of where the thing is and where it's uh, what it's doing while it's there. It's just nothing more really than the time, the uh, acceleration, the velocity, and the position. Uh, especially effective, we looked at a couple of different coordinate systems that do better for different problems than some others. Um, but it's basically kind of the same stuff we, we did in Physics 1. Now we're going to do the next part of it, which is just like uh, what we did in Physics 1 at this time. In fact, it's today that we're doing it there. And that's that we now look at the uh, particle kinetics. This is the simple fact of addressing if we have some acceleration, how do we either maintain that, how do we change it, how do we avoid acceleration? That's certainly all we do in statics. Uh, so it's all, it's all basically about the acceleration and the other things come from it. But the problems can come from either direction. If you remember from Physics 1, we had three different ways that we address these problems. And we'll look at those three again in this class just again in a little bit more advanced way. We have other coordinate systems we can use in this class. We have more, uh, more sophisticated uh, techniques we can use and problems we can solve. But the uh, uh, one we'll address today for a day or two is uh, the very familiar Newton's Law. Uh, Newton has three laws. Um, the first two are really just two different forms of this one. We'll, we'll refresh them a little bit uh, in a bit here just to make sure we got them. We'll do a couple straightforward problems, maybe a little bit more than we would have done in Physics 1. Um, then uh, the second one, we'll again come back to the work energy equation, <coughs> way to solve problems. Uh, this is kind of like it was in the using the different coordinate systems for us. Uh, each one of these tends to solve a different type of problem a little bit easier. But all of these, especially these last two, the work energy and the impulse momentum equations, they spring right from F equals MA. So these aren't exclusive of each other. These will really just be different ways to look at problems where we sort out some of the things ahead of time uh, that may have been a little more cumbersome if we try to get to them through there. So uh, we'll spend a day or two here looking uh, uh, back at F equals MA, the, uh, the, uh, the simple Newton's laws as, uh, as he first stated them. Uh, his first law was and you've heard it in various forms. In fact, it's even running on a commercial right now that an object in motion remains in motion. It's, it's, if you go out on the street, talk to the clowns out there, ask them, well, what are you wonder one of Newton's laws? That's a, as much as they'll come up with for you. For our purposes, it's not, uh, it's not precise enough. Uh, when you say an object in motion will remain in motion, what we mean more precisely is that an object in motion will remain uh, in that precise type of motion in the absence of unbalanced forces. But to us, what that means is that the acceleration will be zero. The only way the acceleration is going to be zero is if the sum of the forces is zero. So Newton's first law is really that um, where those two really mean to us the very same thing. These, it can't be that one is true and the other doesn't directly follow either direction. So maybe we'll put a magical arrow there that just reminds us that both of those things uh, must be true and uh, 
uh, for, for the other one to also be true. Uh, of course, what this then means to us, if the acceleration is zero, then the velocity vector is constant. And so that's a little bit more of what you'll hear from Newton's first law, that an object uh, at rest will stay at rest. So that's a particular case of the velocity being zero, which is certainly a constant, sometimes one of our favorite constants. Uh, or an object moving in a straight line at constant speed will remain in that kind of motion, which again is a constant velocity situation. Remember that velocity, of course, is a vector. Then Newton's second law, and personally I don't see that they're all that different from each other, is just the case when A is not equal to zero, then if the forces are unbalanced, then a mass will accelerate, the mass upon which those forces are acting. So this is, of course, then a situation where A is not equal to zero, <coughs> and V is not equal to a constant. And that, for the most what dynamics is about. However, we will look at some problems where the uh, linear acceleration is constant, but the angular acceleration might not be, and that will also fall into our category of, of dynamics types of equations, a uh, problem <coughs> that we're looking at here. And then, oh, then of course the third law is more subtle, everybody out on the street can say it, but they don't necessarily understand what it means or where it comes from. Um, and that's the uh, law of action-reaction. That any force exerted on one object <coughs> causes that object to exert an equal and opposite force back on whatever the first thing was. Uh, this is the... the uh, I guess the, uh, the wonderful law that makes uh, uh, boxing the important sport it is. And we're going to have women in the Olympics boxing this year in London. So, you're going to boxing? Yeah. He's boxing. Uh, uh, personally, uh, women certainly have the right to box if they'd like. It's just, I thought they'd have more sense than that. But yeah. So, so there's going to be women's boxing. Uh, for those women, they are no brighter than the men who box. God bless them all. Okay, so we've got, we've got uh, uh, for our full three-dimensional problems, we right now have three equations. Which, of course, are those three equations. Um, Obviously, that's not going to work as three, so it's the three coordinate directions of our three-dimensional space. And if we're in Cartesian coordinates, it's like that. If it's in uh, polar or uh, cylindrical coordinates, cylindrical coordinates being the 3D version of polar, where it's our spherical coordinates. Uh, we again have three, it's just the, the subscripts would be different. So for now, we can handle any, any problem is actually limited by how much, how many, uh, uh, coordinate directions we're using in our problems. If we have three coordinate directions, then we have the three kinetics equations to use. If we're only doing two uh, coordinate directions, two-dimensional space will only have two directions. However, we also have at our disposal any of the kinematics things we looked at in the opening weeks of the term which means we can solve more problems, uh, solve problems with more unknowns than just however many coordinate directions there are. If we 
can use any of the kinematics questions that uh, uh, would apply. All right, a little bit of a rehash to make sure we got all these pieces. Since we're looking at forces, we need to make sure we know what all the possibilities are. All these forces we're working with are vectors, which means we need to know to define the vector both its direction and its magnitude. So some of these forces, we already know one or the other of those, makes uh, the problem a little bit easier. Remember, you're trying to get as many equations as you can for each of the unknowns in the problems. So we have uh, different types of forces. Of course, there are general types. These are uh, just pushes, pulls, those kind of things, something reaching in and moving the object around in some way. Exclusive of any of the others that are going to come up on the list. So uh, that involves a, a lot of uh, different things. Sometimes it's just somebody reaching in and pushing. It can also be the subclass on pulls, which are ropes, strings, cables, chains, all of those things that uh, you might find in your bedroom, hanging from the wall. All of those things are those, those type of, like the, the deal is you can't push with any of these. You can only pull with these. Uh, if you don't believe me, by golly, you're welcome to go try. Um, I guess you could you could soak a rope in water, freeze it, and then push with it in some measure, but uh, that's not typically what we're doing. These only pull, and they <coughs> only do so in their own direction. So that's great when we're looking for forces. We're trying to decrease the number of unknowns. We generally already know the direction. Of a pull due to one of these items. Always pull, never push, and in their own direction. So if you know where the string lies in the problem, you already know the direction, not only the angle, but the, uh, <coughs> the uh, which end the arrowhead goes on for uh, any problem involving ropes, strings, and the like. All of these, though, tend to be uh, what we might consider outside or other type of forces, as we'll explain in a little bit. Uh, other possibilities. Uh, we're certainly going to have some problems with friction in them. Remember that friction is a contact force. It's only due to two different surfaces in contact with each other. It could be that one of the surfaces is a fluid surface, as we have when we have air friction because of air passing over a solid body. But it's still two surfaces in contact. It's always parallel to those surfaces. It's at the surfaces in contact, and it's parallel to those surfaces in contact. So uh, that's, again, good, because that takes up at least part of the direction uh, concern with uh, the force vector. What we don't necessarily know is which end of the force vector, the, the direction that the arrowhead goes on. But we can get some help for it, because friction always opposes the relative motion of those two surfaces. You have to look right at the two surfaces in contact where the friction exists, figure out what would happen if there was no friction, then friction acts to oppose that kind of motion. And you have to be careful, uh, especially as we'll see several times in this class, that the object we're talking about might be moving, but 
the two surfaces in contact are not. That's exactly what happens with your car tires. The automobile is moving, the car tires are turning, but if you're driving carefully, there's no slippage where the two surfaces are in contact. So the two surfaces are not moving with respect to each other, relative to each other, but um, the object itself is undergoing quite a bit of motion. So we'll look at that in some detail and even come up with some things that are uh, pretty interesting and pretty uh, non-intuitive, I think. So um, going with the friction force is the normal force. This is an action-reaction pair. It's the business of uh, an object uh, exerting a force on some surface and that surface exerts a force back on the object. So this too is a contact force. You will not have a normal force unless you have two objects in contact. Uh, it's not uncommon for students to throw a normal force into a problem when there's not even another thing in contact with the uh, object we're talking about, but they just feel like a normal force should be in there. <coughs> so careful sticking those in where they don't belong. These are always perpendicular to the surface, to the surfaces in contact. That's great. Again, we can find out something about the angle at which these forces are acting because we know which, what the angle of the surfaces in contact are. We can do a little better than with friction. Friction is not, uh, we can get an idea of where uh, the arrowhead should go if we can figure out what the motion is going to be. With the normal force, it's always much easier. Uh, the normal force is only a push on the object of, con uh, the object upon which we're doing this force balance. So, it's only a push by the surface on the object we're talking about. If I have something sitting on the table, the table can only push back on it. It cannot pull back on the, uh, on the book. So for accelerating a book, uh, we need to know the normal force. We know its direction. And of course, the uh, normal force and the friction force uh, go together. We don't have friction without a normal force. And by the way, normal is the physics and engineering term for perpendicular. Now, here's my advice to you. After having taught this at RPI in Hudson Valley and up here probably 10 or 12 times, here's my advice for finding the normal force. Use a free body diagram to find it. If you use a free body diagram that's been drawn correctly, you'll be able to find out what the normal force is, its magnitude and its direction. The direction's not as difficult because that's pretty easy to find just from the picture itself. But the magnitude a lot of times is harder. Use a free body diagram. Uh, too many students just assume the normal force and the weight are always equal. And you're not going to get it right if you do that. So the best way I've ever found of finding the normal force with some consistency, and the more consistent you are, the better you do, is to use a free body diagram. So from now on, we'll be doing free body diagrams with some, uh, some, uh, some joy, I can tell. All right, other forces we might see. Forces due to uh, springs uh, or other elastic media. However, we'll mostly use just springs. Um, these can push or pull, depending on what happens to the spring. It comes at some rest length. 
if uh, you compress it, then it pushes back. If you stretch it, it pulls back. Either way, it's uh, we'll take uh, all the springs to be linear springs unless otherwise mentioned. And this del is the difference of the spring from its rest length. So we did a few problems with those in Physics 1. Uh, we'll do more problems in here with those and um, more complicated problems. Now, the thing about springs, as, as we take them, um, the amount of stretch or compression we keep in the linear region, which if we relate that to what happens in strength of materials, we don't stretch the spring to the point where it no longer recovers back to its original length when the force is removed. So this is then one of the things we call a conservative force. Any force that can return back to its original state once uh, everything's been run backwards. The, forces, the force stretching it is removed, it will return to its original length. Um, if you let the problem run backwards again to its original spot, the spring will return to exactly what it was in the original uh, situation. Springs, uh, as we take them in this class, do that. That's not the case with other forces, well, like friction force. If you take a problem, run it one way, turn it around and run it back to its original position, you doubled the amount of friction, not returned to zero where there was no friction. So that's an example of a non-conservative force. Uh, our other best example of conservative forces um, are those due to gravity. These forces, of course, uh, if we return something to its original place, it'll have uh, the same force of gravity on it. Nothing will have changed. And we don't need to do anything more with it than uh, W equals mg, uh, which gives us its magnitude and, of course, its direction, which is always straight down. That's where Mother Earth is, and that's what causes gravity. Now, I say that because I know some of you have had well-meaning high school physics professors before, and when you did an inclined, uh, inclined plane type problem, they told you to take the plane, leave it level, and move the weight force over at the angle. Anybody have a, a phys, high school physics professor did that or teacher that did that for you? Okay, uh, not in here, <clears throat> because to me, that's as if you have moved the Earth over to the side somewhere. As far as I'm concerned, I'd like the Earth where I left, where I found it this morning, and where I'd like to find it this evening and tomorrow morning when I wake up. So, uh, if you do this kind of thing. And I were your boss, if you did something like this, and I'm your boss in an engineering firm, I would think, yeah, I'm not sure that they can handle very sophisticated problems if they can't even handle this in its real situation. They have to make it something artificial, something that doesn't look right, something that could cause other problems and other mistakes. So, Phil, you're the only one who shook your head. We'll be watching you very carefully. Leave. Leave the earth where it is, put the weight straight <coughs> down, leave the plane where it is. Um, we're trying to get more sophisticated as we do these problems. So uh, let's address things as realistically as possible so that we can do better with it all. All right, I think that's our, our catalog of forces for this class. We'll see some. 
Um, there'll be some problems where we even have them all, I think. It's not too difficult to come up with fairly useful problems that, that uh, have them all. All right, one last thing. Uh, our book addresses it a little bit in the early part. Um, I'll uh, simplify it now so that it's much less problem. Uh, general equation F equals MA. From that, we define our units of force. In SI system, of course, it's one Newton, and that's one kilogram accelerated at one meter per second squared or half a kilogram at two meters per second squared or any other multiple thereof. That's the, the magnitude of a force of a Newton. And hopefully you all remember how poetic it is when we have a weight of one Newton is about the same weight as an apple. That's, that's just the poetry of the universe, I think, because we know Newton's story with, uh, with him uh, probably hung over underneath an apple tree and the apple hit him on the head. I don't know if that was a story, something like that. So that's the SI system. Things get a little bit stinky in the English system, as usual. We, uh, we have two, two sets of units, uh, really, in the English system. One is the force unit is a pound force, and that's enough force to cause one pound mass to accelerate at 32.2 feet per second squared. The trouble with this is that the pound as a force and the pound as a mass were defined independently of each other. So that's why we've got that part in there. So uh, I believe they tried to fix it once. I'm not of the opinion that they did, so I'm going to have to fix it one more time. And that's uh, 32 pounds of force is a mass of one slug accelerated at one foot per second squared, which I think is quite possibly the god awfulest, ugliest unit ever contrived, the slug. So I believe there was some mention of that early in the uh, early in the book in the first chapter. Is that right? That was, a couple of those problems had slugs on there. And some, I don't know, I can't remember if there was pound mass or not. Okay. So, that's, that's the English system. Came about because the mass and the force were defined independently of each other, then had to be brought back together. But here's how we're going to be able to handle it in this course. Um, it all comes because of F equals MA, so we're going to work it from that direction. Uh, Any time in this course, when the term a pound is used, whether it's in a problem or whether I use it, pound will always mean a force in this class. Which, obviously, then is that one. Uh, this class, we don't use the little subscript F. Uh, some situations you'll see that those aren't actually subscripts. They'll write it as a full-size letter right beside them. Uh, however, in this class, anytime you see the unit of a pound, it means a force. So if, if we're talking about the weight of something, you know that uh, if it says it's 85 pounds, you take that to be the, the force of gravity on that object always be a pound. So 
uh, as we do it then, well, for example, handle it in this way. So, and if you do it this way, it'll always work out in all our problems and we won't have to deal with any of that stuff. Because if you notice, as I was writing these down, I had to keep looking at them because I, have, I can't keep these straight for the life of me. They're, I, they're terrible units. I don't like them. So, for example, imagine we have a problem where they say we have a 40 pound object. We will know that to mean the weight because pound will always be a force in this class and so that will refer to its weight. So the mass will be then 40 pounds, m equals, or w equals mg, so over g in the English system is that. So if you ever get to a problem in English units where you need the mass, then I recommend you do just this. Of course, 40 divided by 32.2 is 1.24, and then the units are Oh, I put meters there, I meant feet. Then the units are pounds, seconds squared, per foot. And I, if, I, if I were you, I wouldn't do anything else with it but that. What normally happens in these problems is we have to find the mass and then use that in some other part of the problem. If you find the mass, take it over with those units and put it in the other part of the problem then the units just automatically return just like they would have to the original form. That way you never have to worry uh, what's a slug, what's a pound force, what's a pound mass. It will always work out in this class in that way. So just leave them like that, carry it through the problem and the problem will clean up itself if you're watching your units, which you always do anyway. Always. So that's my recommendation to you. If you need to call that something, call it a, a man or something. Name it after a dead white male German physicist. I will leave it at that. But that's my recommendation. That's what I'll do in problems. I'll just leave them. English mass units like that, and they'll straighten up later in the problem and when it all comes back together. Very rarely on these problems, for some reason, do we actually ever have to find the mass as the uh, whole point of the problem. Okay, so let's do a couple. Most of these are warm up and uh, flexing the old physics one muscles that have long since atrophied, so we'll do a couple problems. <coughs> Lots of pushing crates across the floor, if you remember, in physics one. So 60 kilogram crate there with an angled force on it. 300 newtons. 30 degrees. And a coefficient of friction between the box and the surface it rests on of 0.3. So the coefficient of friction, if you remember, uh, is generally around that. I uh, hope you remember what the K implies in this problem then. Now what's, what's this little K imply? Oh, you were being cute. Caught me off guard. He's always cute. He is. <laughs> you know. Well, Chris thinks you are. Always. What's the K stand for? What's the K meaning is happening in this problem that might not happen in other problems at the same time? Now, I, I got it. it. It's the target moving. Well, be more specific, like I told you with friction. <coughs> uh, what if, 
what if the surface it's resting on is just some great big wheel itself, and now we're pushing on it? It can move. Oh, well, no, these surfaces are moving relative to each other. All right. Meaning it's it's sliding over this surface. Whether the surface itself is moving, we have no idea. We don't particularly care yet in this problem. We, we need more information. But it's the fact that the surfaces themselves are slipping over each other because we have this K here for kinetic. Meaning the two surfaces are in motion relative to each other. All right, so from that, we want to find the acceleration. If I only gave you static friction, you could then very easily say, no sweat, man, it's not accelerating because it's static friction. All right, simple as this is, Remember, we've got to have all forces acting on these objects before we can sum the forces to find the acceleration. So I want everybody to draw a free body diagram. You, draw, you don't draw a free body diagram and get these wrong, can't come crying to me. Remember my other students, previous students, what, what to keep in mind for free body diagrams? Nope, evidently not. Large. Think. Large. Yeah, large and? And charge. <laughs> Marge. No, large and? Yeah, all, yeah, don't leave any forces out and don't put any extra in that you don't need, but large in what? Simple. Large and simple. Think football player. Large and simple. So the weight's acting straight down. Of course, we have the applied force there. We don't consider that two forces. We might break it into forces later, but we don't consider it two. It just has two different components to it, its direction and its magnitude. The components are just uh, saying the same thing. So get all the forces in there. Oh, I'm glad we're going over this. I don't see one of them correct yet. Good. Is that Chris's? Chris is too busy jazzing up this picture. You've got to have all of the forces in the picture before you bother going to here. If you're going to here without all the forces, you're not doing the right problem. You're doing some other problem. So we've got the friction force. You can either draw it right like that as the surface, if you wish, or you can just draw it in the y direction some other way. Do we have all the forces? I got a couple no's. <coughs> sooner or later you're done putting up the forces and it's time to then solve the problem. Do we have all the forces? Yeah? No? no? Phil? And don't say no if you don't know which one's missing. Say yes if you don't think any are missing. Because sooner or later we are done. We do have all the forces and it's time to solve the problem. Phil says no. Joey? David, no. Travis already said no. Samantha, not looking at me. No, you're not looking at me. No, you won't talk to me. No. John? Tom? Anthony, Phil, what's missing? The normal force. You can, all, you can almost always look at a problem and tell if something's going to happen with the forces you've got there that shouldn't happen, you need to fix it with more forces. We have two forces down, 
both of those are correct, we know we haven't gotten those wrong, it couldn't be any other way, there's nothing to keep it from going down, except we know that there is. There's a table there, so we're missing the normal force perpendicular to the surface, which means straight up. You can draw it down at the sur surface if you want, but it kind of makes the picture a little goofy, I think, so that'll do just as well. <coughs> now, question for my static students, which is, I think everybody, right? No, Alan, you're the only one who didn't have statics yet. So we'll, we'll let Alan answer this one. Yeah. Alan. Yes. Actually, I'll let everybody answer because I know at least three of you are going to get caught on this question. As drawn, what's to keep the box with the friction going this way underneath, the force going that way over, what's to keep the box from just spinning? From tipping over? Yeah. You've pushed on something and it tipped rather than slid, haven't you? Yeah, but the angle's 30 degrees, so it's more. So what? So. What if it wasn't 30 degrees? It was just you pushing on the top corner. The friction's down there. What's to keep this from going like that? I'm guessing that it would tip over if I did it that way. <laughs> nope. It wouldn't? Nope. Not, not here. It wouldn't. Not right now. Oh, is the moment of the box? I mean, where it's... That it's what? What causes the moment? I'm not exactly sure. I, I, I think it would tip over. It won't. Why not? And we, this, this is complete. Who has this as their free body diagram or something awful close to it? That's complete. There are no other forces. But we have a force down here and a component of the force up there and they're separated by some distance. Doesn't that cause a moment? Why isn't there a moment in this class, in this problem? Why is this sufficient for what we're doing now in this, in this, this section, just the F equals MA? David? It's because we're assuming it to be a particle. Exactly right. We're assuming this to be a particle, which means its own dimensions do not matter. It's a heavy particle. So, this, if you can draw it like that, or you can draw it like that if you'd wish. But remember, we're only looking right now at particle kinetics. We just finished particle kinematics, so we don't worry about the sizes on this. We don't consider that there's any moment there. Later, we will, because we'll start looking at rigid body motion, and then the size very, <coughs> very much matters. Now, there could be problems where somehow the dimensions come into it in some other way, but in this case, we're only looking at those. So this is a complete free body diagram. Remember. If you didn't have me for Physics 1, I don't know if you heard this warning uh, explicitly. Do not put any forces up on a picture that, what do you have to say about each force? My former students. Pertinent, which means we don't include all the forces between atoms and all the internal forces that have action reaction pairs and all cancel anyway. But what else? What forces? Uh, what must you be able to say about any force you put on these diagrams? Man, you guys should sue your Physics 1 professor. He was terrible. What? You have to, it has to be uh, like tangible. You have to be able to put your finger on something. The forces on our diagrams are all caused by something real, something that you can point to, I can put my hand on, that you can describe to me directly that we can all see and agree on. There are no forces that are just there because you feel like it. No forces that are there because the motion. Motion does not cause forces. Forces cause motion. 
So all of these forces on here are caused by something very, very real and tangible in the problem. Whoever's pushing the table, the scratching across the table, the earth, all of those are things that you can directly name. <coughs> and then we can solve the problem in its component directions. Uh, unless stated otherwise, we'll always assume that the xy coordinates are the usual. But we're not bound to that. It's arbitrary. It's, it's not going to change the physics. So we know it's going to accelerate in the x direction. In fact, we're looking for that. We know it's not going to accelerate in the y direction. Because that's just not practical for this problem. So the x forces must sum and have some residual left over that will determine the acceleration for us. So uh, 300 newtons uh, cosine 30 in the negative x direction. Oh no, that's positive. Friction is negative. And we know that those must sum to the acceleration that's going to be experienced. So unlike in statics, where all of the forces sum to zero, only some of them do uh, now in this part of the class. Then, of course, the friction comes from the normal force. What is the normal force? Well, the best way to find it is from the free body diagram. It's got to be equal to the weight in some part, but the weight also has the force down acting with it. And those sum to zero. So a very, very simple case where the weight, or where the normal force is not equal to the weight. So be careful, don't get caught just assuming that the normal force always equals the weight. It doesn't. It's very easy to come up with problems where it's not true. In fact, in terms of friction, you can take the normal force to be the force holding the two surfaces together. Now you can solve the problem. You've got uh, everything down here is given. Yeah, w. w equals mg we do not consider to be an extra equation. We don't consider the weight to be unknown. Um, it's just w equals mg. Very easy to solve. And so you can finish up that problem. Anybody got it all? 0.635. Yeah, acceleration. Just solving this now. It's not an algebra problem. I mean, it's now just an algebra problem. You should get 0.635 meters per second squared. All right, just a warm up from physics one. Maybe you couldn't do it then, but you can do it now. All right, let's, uh, let's look at another one. All right, a cart running on nicely frictionless wheels.
steel bar of some kind going diagonally across it, upon which is a freely sliding collar. That collar can slide up or down, depending upon uh, what's happening with the cart. And in fact, this would serve as an accelerometer. That's at 30 degrees. That's 30 degrees. And I want you to find find the acceleration. There's one particular acceleration that will allow that collar to stay right there. If it accelerates it greater than that rate, the collar will slide up. If it accelerates it less than that rate, the collar will slide down. So find the acceleration that allows that collar to stay right there. Remember, this is frictionless. free to slide on that bar. So what's the acceleration that keeps it right where it is? And we got all the pieces, yeah. All right. Acceleration obviously is going to come from a force balance on it. So um, we must, we need to figure out what forces are on the collar that allow it to accelerate like that. So well, we'll, we'll leave it like that for, for a second now. Obviously the cart and the collar are accelerating at the same rate because they're not moving relative to each other. So let's try a free body diagram of the collar. Because if we can find out the acceleration of that, it's the same as the acceleration of the cart, because they're one and the same. So you draw a free body diagram of the collar with all the pertinent forces, forces exerted by something you can name, point to, we can see. I'll give you the easy one. It weighs something. Otherwise, it wouldn't slide down if the acceleration was too little. But clearly, that can't be it. Because if there's no force in the x-direction, there won't be any acceleration in the x-direction. So there must be other forces in this problem. And there must be at least some component thereof unbalanced in the x-direction. If there's any component in the x-direction, but it gets balanced, then there wouldn't be an acceleration in the x-direction. What's causing that? Name it, remember? Something I can see, something I can touch, something I can... Don't put any forces up here if you can't tell me exactly what's causing it. There 
there must be some force in the x direction or it's not going to accelerate in the x direction. Simple as that. So, what's causing that, Phil? Is that a force? Sure, yeah. What's causing it? Good thing you put that in pencil. A couple of you have it. A couple of you aren't playing along. Now, we expect it to accelerate in that direction. So, what's causing those forces? Or right, that's a component of this one? Okay, what's causing that force? Plus, you've got to have some force in the, in the direction, the x direction. There must be something. What's causing that force? No, I said movement doesn't cause forces. Real things cause forces. You need to tell me something concrete, something tangible, something very real. Movement's kind of ephemeral. <coughs> What? Gonna have to, yeah, you're going to have to Google that. Ephemeral. 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 It means fleeting, wispy, misty, mysterious. Is that too poetic for you? Beautiful. Beautiful. What other forces could there be? It can't be any springs, strings, ropes, cables. Um, can't be any friction. Because the scent is frictionless. Um, got the weight. What else is left? There's a possibility. There's only one other thing I think I had on that list. Normal force, which is a contact force. What is that thing in contact with? The bar. bar. The bar. It's in contact with this bar. It's a free body diagram, free of everything we're not concerned with. We want the acceleration of this because that will be the same as the acceleration of the cart. So we, if we get the acceleration of that free of the bar, at least in the drawing, but that bar is exerting a force on that collar. How did I say normal forces act? Perpendicular to what? Perpendicular to the surfaces in contact. If this cart's moving forward by whatever means, I didn't say anything about that, we're not looking for that. Cart's moving forward, the bar is going to push on the column to bring it along. So it's actually acting along this bottom surface, well, just inside where the bar goes through the collar, but it's perpendicular to that surface. So it's got to be like that. The surfaces in contact are inside the collar, right along there. What? You okay, have that? You said it was wrong. So, no, well, you didn't have that. You had to point the other way. Do we have to roll tape back? <laughs> now, a couple of you had it, though. Ken, you had it. Who else had that? Travis, did you? Oh, you had it the horizontal. Remember, it's perpendicular to surfaces in contact. So, <coughs> however, we don't go to the sum of the forces until we have all of the forces. <coughs> and I don't mean any com components in different degrees. That's just the same force broken into pieces. Any new forces, other, other forces on this picture. We've got to get them all, but there's just no point going to this early. So you had those two forces down, but what else? Was that that's it? Question mark? No, I think that's period. Yeah, that, there aren't. There's nothing else in this. Nothing else on this list that could have added to the the forces uh, of any that we have any possibility of. So, um, what about the weight, though? Do we know it? 
Now, I don't ever leave things off the drawings. That's not what you want to do. But don't make up a number. It's a particle, right? That doesn't mean it weighs 9.8 atoms. It's just atom. All right, where's the x direction? It's arbitrary, but let's pick something. All right. Now, on these problems where there's some angle in the problem, you have a choice. You can either angle it in the direction of most of the forces. That just makes the, the fewer sines and cosines you'll need in there. Well, there's only two forces, and that's not going to help any. So my suggestion is angle the coordinates in the direction of the solution you're looking for. We're looking for the x acceleration, so let's put x in that direction. It'll make uh, the problem a little bit simpler, a little bit more straightforward. All right, so any forces in the x direction are going to cause the x acceleration we're looking for. So we'll sum all the forces and find that acceleration. <coughs> so let's see. Uh, uh, N in the x direction, I think is N sine theta, sine 30. Is that right? We don't know what n is, but we know what 30 is. Sine 60? Mm -hmm. No, it would be called sine 60. No, it's <laughs> sine 30, right? Yeah. Oh, uh, I, I recommend you stay with the angles given. Yeah, you can go to 90, but anytime you jump like that, there's a possibility of making a mistake or confusing someone. So, there's the, uh, that's all the forces in the x direction. It's going to cause this collar to accelerate. We're looking for that acceleration because it's got to be the same as the cart. Even if we don't know the weight of the cart, it's got to be that. Sum the forces in the y direction, but we know the y direction acceleration is zero. See, now if we'd incline the axes, we'd have accelerations on both of those. So again, it's another reason to make it a little bit simpler if we put the axes in the direction of the one thing we're looking for, especially if it's acceleration. So now we have the up forces must equal the down forces because they sum to zero. So n cosine 30 equals w equals mg. We don't know what m is, though. What do we do? Go on eBay and buy some mass? Try some algebra. It'll cancel, because these are all linear equations in each other. So when we solve for n, put it up here, the M here will cancel the M there. And you're all done. And interestingly enough, then, for any setup with a cart, with a collar on a frictionless shaft at 30 degrees, we'll always have the same solution, no matter how big or small it is. <coughs> as long as that's frictionless and that's 30 degrees, you'll get the same solution. Chris, you have it? Root 3g, what's that mean? Square root of 3 times g. I'm an engineer, I need numbers. Uh, root 3g, yeah. Gotta get you away from the math people, into the real world. David? How about 5.66 meters per second squared? Good enough. 5.7 5. or so. I don't know, is that root 3g? Uh, I don't know. If you're gonna say root something, make it root 66. Nobody knows that. Yeah. What a great show. What's a show? David. David. David, your age is showing. All right. Here's one for you. Don't always need to find the mass. Uh, doesn't mean it's not worth asking. I remember once many, many years ago, I accidentally left something off on, on a drawing that I was <coughs> expecting the students to do. Okay, so here, here's the 
Here's my pickup. Here's my uh, flatbed truck. Looks just like my car. What's the maximum deceleration this truck can do such that the cart does not slide on the back of the truck? It decelerates too, de decelerates too hard, slams on the brake too hard, the crate's going to slide forward on the bed. If he, well, you've got to find the maximum because anything less than that, it won't slide. So we don't have to go on the other side of this. Uh, coming in at 70 kilometers per hour and the coefficient of friction between the bed of the truck and the crate is 0.3 again. Static or kinetic? Heard a couple say static. Is that it? What do you look at? Surfaces the two surfaces in contact. Yes, the crate's moving, but we don't want it to move relative to the flatbed of the truck. So use static friction. Want the maximum deceleration. By max x double dot so that the crate doesn't slide. And in addition, find how far the what the what the braking distance is. parts on this so maybe maybe we are no, no delaying let me just double check make sure nothing's missing don't need a massive box or anything it's the uh, biggest box in the world say my uh my mother-in-law's inside. I'm helping her move. Like a good son-in-law would do. Sorry, Nana. Just kidding. Oh, it's hoarding. Speed up a little bit, though. All right, got the initial velocity. Want the truck brought to a stop without the crate sliding, without tying it down. You got something now? No. Protesting? Free body diagram of what? Yeah, the box will work. 
because the box and the truck are going to have the same deceleration, so uh, mine will keep it small. <coughs> Plus, um, we don't we don't know any of the normal forces. Uh, tricky things happen when four wheel vehicles are putting on the brakes uh, that make them rigid body problems as often as not. So pretty easy just to do the crate. So free body diagram of the crate. Including all forces, what's that? What's causing that? No, motion does not cause forces. Other way around. It's got to be something, remember, you can touch, you can show me, you can point to. And I can't touch the acceleration. I can see it, I guess. Don't make these too small. Generous, big, simple football player type pictures. So, what do you have for free body diagram then, Tom? Is that it? You think so? Let's see. Box has weight. If you want, you can just put mg in there straight and just skip the w part. Obviously, there's a normal force perpendicular to the bed of the truck. What else? That crate is moving 70 kilometers per hour as well. We also have to bring it to a stop, which means we need some force in the direction opposite the velocity to bring it to a stop. And that's the friction. If you want, you can put it right there. If you'd rather, you can put it at the surface. I like to put it at the surface. Just reminds me where it is and what it's parallel to. But again, we're treating the box as a particle. Any other forces? No sense summing the forces to find the acceleration if we don't have all the forces. Is that another friction force for the bed of the truck? What's causing that friction force? That is the that's the friction force between the bed and the truck. I don't care which way you draw these. If you draw it like that or not, it's the same problem since we're working with particles at this point in the class. The, the object has no real dimension of its own. What's that? That's the acceleration? D is that a minus? Let's see. Then don't forget to find the distance. Okay, that looks right, Travis. Anybody else? Got something? Yeah, that looks right. So now figure the distance. <coughs> Shouldn't be. This is another one where the uh, mass of it should cancel. Any crate, as long as it has that friction coefficient with the truck bed, any crate will um, see the same maximum acceleration. Anybody have anything other than that for the free body diagram? Again, on this one, the mass should cancel out just like it did before. Uh, if you want, you can also put on the diagram, maybe in a different color, the dynamics of the situation that you expect to happen. Uh, some books actually teach that as a separate drawing. The, the kinematic drawing is the results of those friction of that friction. Now, if we draw it like that, then obviously the, in the acceleration we find will be negative. So we certainly don't expect acceleration like that with only one horizontal force and it's in the opposite direction of that. Okay, is that it? Okay, looks good. Got the distance, Travis? 
So you're willing to go stand a half a meter farther, oh, you'd get run over. Actually, you wouldn't even see the truck, much less than that. So double check something. Something went wrong. Some forces in the x direction. That'll give us the acceleration we're looking for. <coughs> so we have minus F, which is mu S N. If we remember uh, the static friction, that's the maximum static friction. But we're looking for the maximum acceleration, so we'd be at the maximum static friction. And that will give us the acceleration. So the minus sign makes sense there, since it's opposed to what I drew for the positive direction. But we don't know the normal force. So we have to go into the y direction. This time, n equals w. But as we've already seen, it doesn't always. So the ends cancel. We get the acceleration as minus mg minus mu s um, g. Is that right? But not root 3g. Uh, minus 2.94 meters per second squared. Then how about the distance? Assume that acceleration to be constant and then use constant acceleration equations. We've got uh, initial velocity. Now we have acceleration. What's the third thing we know? Final velocity. Final velocity. We're trying to bring it to a stop. So with those three things known, you should uh, do okay with, with that equation, you can find delta S. Travis, did you come up with a different number? Yeah. It's? 3.3. I have 64.4 meters. 64.4 meters. Well, now I'm, I'm putting in a little bit so you don't actually get hit. <coughs> All right, that's it then. If there are any questions, Joe, you okay? Uh,